Okay, in a previous video, we looked at something called the first isomorphism theorem. And in fact, I made a huge hour long video on a bunch of applications of the first isomorphism theorem. So if you have any questions on that or want examples, I urge you to look at that video. I think it's a, a great resource for looking at examples of isomorphisms between groups, mostly using the first isomorphism theorem. So today we want to look at something called the second isomorphism theorem. So before we do that, let's recall the first. So if we have phi, which is a homomorphism between two groups, G1 and G2, then we have the following isomorphism between G mod the kernel of phi and the image of phi. So notice that the kernel of phi needs to be a normal subgroup of G1 in order for the left-hand side to make sense, but it is. That's easy to prove, and we've done that in the past. And then the image of phi is a natural subgroup of G2. Okay, so the second isomorphism theorem is stated in the following way. So we'll let G be a group, so I didn't write that down, but let's let G be a group. H is a subgroup of G, and N is a normal subgroup of G. Then we have three things to prove. Well, really four things. We need to show that HN is a subgroup of G. Then we need to show that H intersect N is a subgroup of H and that N is a subgroup of HN. And then finally, the isomorphism part of this theorem, which says that H mod H intersect N is isomorphic to HN mod N. So the way you can think about this is, in some ways you're like canceling the denominator right here, but you can't quite cancel the denominator right here down to H. You cancel it down to this like um, equivalence up to this intersection. Okay, so let's get to proving this starting with part one. So in order to prove part one, we'll go ahead and use the subgroup test. Uh, my favorite way to prove something is a subgroup generally, and that uh, works in the following way. So K is a subgroup of G. So since we have H and N over here, I use this other letter K just to recall the statement of the subgroup test. If and only if, for all X and Y in K, X, Y inverse is also in K. So that's the statement of the subgroup test. We only have to show that one thing is in uh, the subgroup instead of uh, three things. Okay, good. So for us, we want to show that HN is a subgroup of G. So let's go ahead and take an arbitrary X and Y from HN. And let's recall what that means. So that means that X equals H1 uh, N1 and Y equals H2 N2. And here H1 and H2 come from the subgroup H and N1 and N2 come from the subgroup N. Okay, so now let's recall the following fact. Since... N is a normal subgroup of G, we know that um, GN equals NG for all G in G. Okay? So, in other words, the left coset is equal to the corresponding right coset. But notice, what does this mean element-wise? This means that GN equals N prime G for sum n prime n n. So in other words, if we take an n, we can do this commutation, but we'll just pick up another element from the normal subgroup. Okay, so we'll use this fact of normality in order to prove that hn is a subgroup using the subgroup test. So let's go ahead and take x, y inverse. So notice that's h1 n1 times h2 n2 quantity inverse. But then by the sho shoes and socks theorem, we have to reverse the order of that as we take the inverse. So that's going to give us H1, N1 times N2 inverse. I'm going to group those elements of N right there. Okay. Um, and then we have this is times H2 inverse. Okay, great. But now notice that we have an element from N times an element from, from G. So this is an N. And this is just an arbitrary element from the group. And we know that we can reverse the order of those. 
at the cost of maybe changing exactly what that value from the normal subgroup is, since this is a normal subgroup. So that means we can write this as H1, H2 inverse times N, and then maybe I'll put like a little hat over it. Okay, and so what I did there is I reversed the order of these two guys, but that is at the cost of changing the identity of this. Okay, so we've got something like that, but now notice that this is an element of HN, and that's because N hat is obviously an N, and then H1 times H2 inverse is in H because H itself is a subgroup. Okay, so that means we've proven uh, number one here. We can put a little check mark next to it. Now we'll move on to number two. Okay, so now we're moving on to part two, which says that H intersect N is a normal subgroup of H, and that N is a normal subgroup of H times N. So we're not gonna prove this first one. We'll see that we'll kind of get that for free once we move on to part three. We're gonna prove this second bit. So we wanna prove that N is a normal subgroup of HN. Now, uh, let's go ahead and recall what it takes to be a normal subgroup. So again, I'll use K. So we say K is a normal subgroup of G um, if, so for all uh, little k in K and little g in G, we have G K G inverse is an element from K. So there's a bunch of like equivalent definitions of a normal subgroup, but this is a nice element-wise definition of a normal subgroup that doesn't need anything with uh, cosets or whatever. Okay, so let's go ahead and apply this definition of a normal subgroup to our setup. So let's go ahead and suppose that X, or maybe we'll say little n is from n, and then X is from hn. Okay, and then let's notice that what we want to show is that um, x in x inverse is in fact in n. That's what we're going for. Okay, so uh, notice that since x is in hn, that means we can write x as h um, times n. Well, I've already used a little n here, so let's maybe call these like um, n prime. And this is for h and h and n prime and n. That's just the definition of this hn. Recall, we just proved that th that was a subgroup, so that's nice. Okay, so now let's calculate this thing x n x inverse. So notice x n x inverse looks like the following shape. So we have h n prime times n times n prime inverse times h inverse. Okay, but now we can reassociate this and notice that this is equal to h n prime n n prime inverse times h inverse. But notice that we can say h is just a stand-in for an element from the group, and then all of this is made up of elements from n, and so this is of the form h and then some element from n, we'll call it maybe n hat, where we've collided all those together to become n hat times h inverse. But notice that is going to be n, but that's going to be in uh, n, and that's because h is any element from g and n hat is in n, and n is a normal subgroup of g. Okay, good. So, um, we've proven that N is a normal subgroup of HN, so I'll clean up the board and then we're ready to prove this isomorphism. Okay, so we proved the second one. Well, actually, we only proved this part, that N is a normal subgroup of HN. We'll see that we'll get this for free by the proof of this third statement. So, we're going to prove this third statement by invoking the first isomorphism theorem. So, that means one of these sides, we don't need to have uh, the quotient group to start with. We'll get the quotient group by having the kernel here. And, in fact, this is written in the right direction. So, we'll define a homomorphism phi from H to HN mod N.
And then we want to define it in a way so that it is surjective. So let's just say what our goals are. This thing needs to be surjective. In other words, the image needs to be the whole uh, uh, right-hand side. And then the kernel of phi needs to be equal to H intersect N. And then if we achieve those two goals with the definition of this homomorphism, then we can invoke this first isomorphism theorem in order to get this uh, third statement right here. Okay, so let's see how we can define this. So let's define it in the following way. So uh, we'll say phi of H is equal to the coset HN. So uh, you can check that that's a homomorphism, but it's sort of obviously a homomorphism. Um, notice that if we took phi of xy, that's going to be equal to xyn. But then, since that is a quotient group on the right-hand side, we know the multiplication in the quotient group is defined in the following way, xn, uh, yn, but that's e exactly equal to phi of x, phi of y. So yeah, we do have a homomorphism. So the next thing we need to show is that this thing is surjective. In other words, we want the image of phi to be equal to hn mod n. Okay, so in order to show this thing is surjective, we need to take something from the right-hand side, in other words, from the codomain, and find an element that is mapped onto it um, from the domain under this homomorphism. So let's suppose that xn is in hn mod n. In other words, we have x is in hn. Right, so that's the shape of the elements in the group on the right-hand side. Well, what that tells us is that x equals little h times little n, where little h is in big H and little n is in big N. Okay, good. But now, notice that we have the following coset equality. So xn is the same thing as hnn, right? Because that's exactly how x is defined. But now notice that's the same thing as hn. By a standard coset equality um, theorem that was proven earlier on the channel. Great. So now what we can do is also notice that we can take phi of h will be this hn, which is exactly equal to xn, which was the element that we arbitrarily chose on the left-hand side. So great, we've got a surjective homomorphism. Now the next thing we want to do is calculate the kernel. Um, so I'm going to maybe clean up the board and uh, so that we have some room to do that. Okay, so we've got our homomorphism between H and HN mod N. We've shown that it's a homomorphism for sure. We've checked that it's surjective. So now we just need to look at the kernel. So let's recall that the kernel of phi, that's going to be given by all H in H such that um, phi of H equals the identity over here on the right hand side. In other words, the coset EN or just the coset which is given by the normal subgroup itself. Okay, great. But now by our uh, definition of phi, notice that H is in the kernel of phi, that implies that phi of H um, is equal to this coset given by the normal subgroup itself, but that tells us that Hn is given by this coset given by the normal subgroup itself. Here we used the definition of our homomorphism, but then by a standard coset inequality, or sorry, a coset equality um, theorem, which again was proven earlier on the channel, this tells us that H is definitely an element of N. That's the only way you can have that coset equality right there. Okay, so let's see what we have. We have um, H comes from the domain in the first place. So the, dom the domain is capital H. Then we end it down here with, if it's in the kernel, then it's also in N. So what that tells us is that this little H is in fact in um, H intersect N.
So let's see what we've proven here. We haven't actually proven that the kernel is H intersect N. We've just proven that the kernel of phi is contained in H intersect N. Great. So what we really need to show is that the kernel is equal to that. So let's show that by uh, the inclusion the other way. So let's go ahead and suppose that x is in h intersect n, right? But that means that x is in n. Well, and it's in h, obviously. Um, but that tells us that uh, the coset x in equals the coset, which is just given by the subgroup itself, n. But what that tells us is that phi of x equals the coset given by the group n because we have x in is equal to phi of x. But then finally, what that tells us is that x is in the kernel of phi. So what we have from this last line here is that h intersect n is a subset of the kernel of phi. So what that tells us is that the kernel of phi is equal to h intersect n. So we're almost done. So I'll just fit that in here. Here we have the kernel of phi equals h intersect n. Okay, so the image of phi is the whole right hand side. This is a homomorphism. The kernel of phi is h intersect n, so we can apply the first isomorphism theorem, and that gives us this third statement right here and finishes the proof. All right, this is a good place to stop.